Welcome back to Rethinking Politics. I'm Dan, I'm here with Brad. Today we're going to be talking about socialism. This is episode 46. In the last couple of weeks we've been talking about the two of the parties and two of the parties, yeah. as if there is we didn't old, mention as if there any are more other parties, matter. just those two. <laughs> <laughs> it, talking about those episodes made me more and more wish for the proportional representation idea, right? Where, where you're, you get a percentage of votes and then you get seats according to that percentage of votes. So that if you get 5% of the vote, boom, you get 5% of the seats. And then it actually matters. You could actually break the stranglehold of the two parties, but whatever. For now, <laughs> we're talking socialism. And we're talking socialism because it's getting more and more popular. Needless to say, socialism has gained a lot of popularity young, among young people And there's a very good reason for it. And the reason for it is, in many ways, it seems like the only viable option that's left. Which is, I think, mostly conservatives' fault. I'm just going to come out and say it, that that conservatives have done a very bad job over the past, definitely at least the past 20 years, in explaining their ideas, and even in understanding their own ideas and philosophies. The philosophy and ideas of conservatism have struggled, and because of that, it's left the door open for socialism among young people. A great example of that is is the idea of meritocracy, which we've talked about before. The idea that, that the rich are rich because they worked hard, and the poor are poor because they chose to be or because they were lazy or because they didn't really try and that it all comes down to personal responsibility in this world and that's how you make it or break it and that is the conservative line that's the line that's touted again and again and again and the older generations talk about how when they were young they put in the work they went they they paid their way through college they got a degree and then they went to work for a business and and look at how well they're doing now. All these young people growing up in today's world, which is very different than, you know, the world 20, 30, 40 years ago, look around at people who are struggling and there seems to be no explanation for it. Look around at the opportunities they have and and where they've been pushed by societal expectations and how unrewarding their efforts have been in many cases. And they say, this does not seem at all like a meritocracy. This seems like it it seems arbitrary and it seems to be based on so many other things that aren't about how smart I am, how hard I'm willing to work. So what other explanations are out there? And that's when you start looking and then that's where socialism comes in. I mean, that's where the ideas behind socialism, which, you know, which when it comes down to it are basically... Marxist ideas about how the world works and how property works and starts to offer an explanation for why it's so hard for you today versus people in the past. Right. And you get even to the degree that it seems to reflect a meritocracy, like no doubt, no doubt someone who works hard or or rather, if I work hard, I will do better than if I don't work hard. That much is, is, is almost guaranteed to be true. It's not always true. Even then, it's possible that my efforts will be futile for various reasons. You know, maybe I get extremely sick and then none of it, none of it matters, right? None of the, how, how hard, I, hard I could work doesn't, becomes irrelevant. But it takes just one person who, who has been told that personal responsibility is enough through and through. And then you meet the guy who has done all those things and is still failing. And there doesn't seem to be any help for him. There doesn't seem to be any answer for him. And that, for a lot of people, is enough to be like, the system as it is has a problem that is not being addressed. And where do you go? Where, what mm-hmm. what would address that? As Brad said, it seems the only answer on the table is some kind of socialism. And, and the, another point with that meritocracy idea, there are many merits that people can have, many virtues that people can have, some of which seem to be rewarded, some of which, you know, in a general correlative sense, like hard work, hard work is rewarded at least to a degree. There is certainly a correlation between hard work and success. But what about other things? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think mostly of artists. There's a lot of films and things about this, about the struggling artist who gets nothing. And 
and the uh, the people who are following their their passions and their talents or whatever, and it's it, it's not profitable at all. Mm-hmm. Right? They're mm-hmm. working hard at it. They're doing the things that they think they 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 should do. They've got the right credentials. They've they've gone through the steps that they were told to go through, and they end up at dead ends. And artists, I think, is a great example because. In, in any type of art, you've got a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction who are making a lot of money and are very successful and are well-known. And then you have millions of people who are making nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's very little in between. There's almost nothing in between. You've either made it and you're at the top and you're well-known, or you haven't and you're making nothing. Um, you know, virtually nothing, and often literally nothing. And in many cases, then those who are who are at the top make making their millions versus those who are making nothing or next to nothing have worked the same amount. You know, there you can mm-hmm. of, for every ten people who have made it, you can find a hundred who've worked just as hard as them, and you can argue have just as much talent, right? But who, for whatever reason, were not discovered. Or didn't have that breakthrough moment, and so therefore are left behind. And so you can't say, okay, this is you know this is a meritocracy when you have those hundred who haven't made it, and it's not for lack of effort on their part, or lack of skill, or lack of training, or lack of anything beyond what appears to be either luck or connections. Yes, yeah, a market is not a meritocracy. It's not. It never was. It never will be. You look at, you look at like the, the NBA, right? The NBA is the peak of basketball in the world. And there you could say there's something of a meritocracy along one dimension, Mm -hmm. the skill at basketball. And it's not always fair, but it's, it's pretty good. But in terms of like a meritocracy that could assess an entire person and determine whether you deserve success in life or failure in life, there just isn't one. And I think if you made one, it would be a nightmare <laughs> because, <laughs> because how do you judge an entire human being, right? How do you, mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. wants that responsibility to determine whether or not this person deserves a nice house or doesn't or deserves you know, that? That would be a terrible position to be in. I don't think anyone is fit to make that call. But where we want to go with this is, is that you reach this point where you see this system that's supposed to be the best system and you see these people who are struggling, you see these people who are disadvantaged, and then you see those who are succeeding and you ask the question, why is one group doing well while the other group is doing bad? And socialism and Marxism have an answer for you. They say the answer is property, that those who already have property have the advantage and that that advantage is inherently unjust. And when you're looking at it from the sense of a meritocracy, what they're saying makes sense. You know what I mean? If your parents have wealth, you are in a better position to succeed. If you know people who are wealthy, who have these connections, who are powerful, you are more likely to succeed than those who don't. And so that's where we get into socialism. And that's why socialism becomes such a such an appealing option. It is an appealing option. And it's a it's an appealing option that comes in part because as Brad was saying, that the idea that conservatives push of, of a meritocracy and the idea that comes out of the dichotomy we've mentioned in our last two episodes, where you have Republicans against government supporting businesses, and they do so indiscriminately. They don't note the connections that we mentioned last time where businesses and government work together. They're aware of some corporate crime, but it's at a, but it's at a very particular level and in very particular ways. And they don't realize some of the systemic things that they've created that make businesses a certain way rather than other ways that are shaped by laws rather than shaped by markets. And all of these have led them to hold up something of a, <laughs> I would say it's a straw man if it weren't actually their position, but but it's a straw man of the much better position of the much better, well thought out ideas that they, as Brad indicated, haven't studied and haven't understood and haven't defended, and in part because they haven't, they they drift from those principles and they, in more and more, act directly contrary to them. 
And all of that gives the person who is compassionate and who is looking at these things reasons to, to join with the only faction they can find who seems to have an answer to these problems. Which brings us back to this rising tide of socialism. And, and by the way, I, I may use socialism, Marxism, communism a little bit interchangeably here. And that may be a bit confusing. So, so Karl Marx came up with his key idea that property is theft. And from that idea was born many ideas. And modern day socialism is based on Marxism. Modern day communism is also based on Marxism. And so really when I'm talking about socialism here, what I'm talking about is Marxism. And communism, if you look it up, you know, in dictionaries, is going to have a different definition than socialism. And th there is a difference, and how you use it does have an effect. But, but in terms of how the economic systems work, we're talking about the same thing. The difference between communism and socialism is that socialism is an economic theory. Communism is a complete political theory that includes the economic theory of socialism. So what I'm talking about here is the economic theory. I'm not talking about whether or not the proletariat should overthrow the bourgeoisie or anything <laughs> like that. I'm just talking about the economic theories behind communism, which is socialism and or Marxism. But Karl Marx comes up with his key idea that property is theft. I mean, you take it back to Karl Marx. You see the factory owner who owns the factory, who doesn't work, who doesn't lift a finger. He even has a manager who runs the factory for him. So the, the factory owner is not even at the factory. He's at home. You know, the factory manager's running the factory. He's making business decisions. You know, you've got the factory workers who are actually doing the physical work that needs to be done. And then the factory owner walks away with the biggest cut of the profits. The workers make the least, then the factory manager makes a little bit more, and then the factory owner takes the lion's share. And he looks at this and says, okay, who here is working? Who here is doing something productive with their lives? And then who here is sitting on their butt? Therefore, <laughs> property is theft. Because the factory owner is stealing from the workers and even from the managers. And yeah, we should be looking at not at property, which is how that's distributed, right? You've got the guy who owns it, who takes the lion's share, and then everyone else is putting in labor rather than property, mm -hmm. and they're taking a fraction of it. And so in this, this balance between what's more valuable, the work or some kind of ownership that doesn't even require work, right? yeah. <laughs> and he goes, this, this is unjust. Mm -hmm. This is terribly unjust. Clearly you should be paid according to your your labor in some sense that that's that's where the value is coming from that's what makes the stuff therefore this is how it should be distributed the workers should get a, a much larger portion and of course a conservative re would reply and say well the the factory owner was the one who had the idea to make the product in the first place he brought in the capital the resources in order to start this process which all cost and now he's benefiting because of that initial cost and and then Karl Marx would reply, well, where did he get that capital? Because, because your average worker never had that opportunity to have that capital. And historically, many, if not, you know, obviously not all, but many of those who have capital got it from someone else. You know, many, many people inherit capital from from family. You know, many people... Or they have connections and stumble into it. You know, there are all these different explanations for how you get capital. And it does not always equate to, I worked harder than you. And, and then Karl Marx would even follow it up with, even if they did work hard, did they work a hundred times harder than, than those factory workers? You know, or is it just that they got lucky? And if they got lucky and now they get to oppress all these factory workers, how is that just? You know, how is that a just system when the factory workers are the one who are actually producing the goods? And this is something that I can see in my own life. Right now, I'm a middle manager working at a warehouse for a fairly large regional company. And so, of course, I'm, I'm fairly low on this totem pole. And I see those above me who are making more than me. And then I see those even higher up who, in many cases, have actually inherited 
their their positions, their partial ownership in this business and the benefits that they experience because of that versus versus the benefits that I've experienced and then the benefits of those beneath me who who came in with no connections with the company, who start at the very bottom and are working incredibly hard and yet for whatever reason have very little to no opportunity to move up and actually make real money within this company because of a number of reasons. You know, there are many different reasons, and this is not a bad company that I work for, and yet still, because of the nature of how this company is set up, the vast majority of these workers are never going to get a real taste of the profits from this company. And that can be frustrating, you know what I mean? That can be frustrating to see these people who are making the big decisions that often from my middle manager perspective seems like terrible decisions so it doesn't seem like they're particularly good at what they do and (laughs) yet they're the ones making the money while those of us down here at the bottom are not and so i can see i can see where Karl marx gets this idea and says wouldn't it be better off if the ones who are actually doing the work were the ones who controlled the outcome. And more importantly, not just better off, but isn't that the only the only just answer? And the resounding answer that's coming across, you know, now years and years later is is yes. People are saying more and more yes. That is the only answer. That is the only solution to this problem is we need to take property away entirely. I mean, that's that's what socialism comes down to is communal ownership of property. We haven't even defined socialism, Dan, as we're talking here. But that's that's Karl Marx's answer is you take property away and instead you have communal ownership. And I don't mean that the the individual warehouse workers own that one company i'm talking about on a national level you get rid of private property and instead you have group ownership of all the means of production so that everyone has an opportunity to succeed yeah let me let me interject there interject. There's, there's something of a split in the road here you could go two different places with this philosophy at this point you you could assume that you accept everything we've set up to this point marx's whole appeal here at this point, the camp in some ways splits. Now, most of them go down one road and a tiny fraction goes down the other road. But, you could, but, but I think understanding the, the two paths here is, is worthwhile. One is you could do exactly what Brad just indicated there at the end. You could say, my fellow workers, it's time for us to start our own thing and we're going to organize the business in a fundamentally different way. We're going to buy it together. We're going to go in on the, we're going to, we're going to assume the risk ourselves. We're going to have, have the loan in our name. You know, we're going to have the, we're going to assume the burden and the debt and the management. And then they would come up with some kind of charter or some kind of uh, agreement on how they're going to make decisions communally. And this, this is pretty ordinary in terms of, in terms of what's possible within a legal system. I, Brad and I could together buy a car and both of our names would be on it. We put both our names on the registration and it would be in, and we would then have to work out how it's going to, mm-hmm. to work. This is, I guess, you know, in a lot of ways, this is basically what a family does, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you all own this together and you have to work out some system that, that keeps everybody more or less happy and how that, how things are going to play out. That is not socialism. Now, you'll hear people attach the word socialism to that, but they're, they're mistaken. That is just merely acting differently within the world of capitalism. And these people are free to do whatever they please with the property. If they want to own it together and make decisions, that's just another form of – that capitalism allows, right? You don't have to change any laws in, to do in that. In fact, there are businesses that are owned that way. That has yes. been done – where workers have purchased the business they worked for and run it as a workers co-op. Yes, exactly. We have a we have a legal term for that. This is where socialism parts ways with uh, I met someone who called themselves an anarcho an anarcho communist. And I thought that's a 
as far as I'm aware, that's a contradiction in terms, but, <laughs> but the idea comes across, right? The idea is that this person wants to take other willing people and live in a certain way that everyone agrees to live with. I don't know anyone who has a major problem with that, as long as all parties are willing and I mean, as I'm saying that, I'm immediately thinking of drugs and other areas in which people are not. There is disagreement among people, but, <laughs> but, in, but in terms of how you organize your business, right? I don't think anyone is going to come across, across the country to yell at you because you've decided that you and five others are going to mm. own the local bookstore instead of one guy owning it mm -hmm. and having five mm -hmm. employees. Right? Yeah, so workers' co-ops are not controversial in that sense. Right. But – there is another route. There's a route where you could say, this is the better way to do it. And so what we need is for society, through the force of government, to assume all control of these institutions. And this is what happens on a smaller scale when you nationalize an industry. This is what happened in China, obviously, but, but even in other cases. People describe fascist countries. One of the, one of the hallmarks of fascism is socialism. People don't seem to, they don't connect those, but they, Hitler and company immediately nationalized many industries, meaning they socialized them. Yeah. <laughs> the words actually, and that used that way, the words mean the exact same thing. Truly. They became common property owned by society and functioned differently. And the profits were used differently and, and went to the government and and so socialism at its heart, as we're using it here, and as I think it is, its history and origin demands, requires government intervention to do it. it this is, that's how society owns anything. This is not like mm -hmm. your family getting together to work something out. This is, the state owns it, and you participate in that ownership through your participation in the state. Mm -hmm. Because there's simply no other way. There's no other right. way to have that kind of group ownership without some kind of some kind of government. It's never right. it's never happened historically and and there's never been an a reasonable case made for how it could could exist. Right. The bookstore co op works because those people could leave if they wanted to at any moment. They could they can come and go as they please. But if you're gonna do it with all of society there are going to be a lot of people who disagree, and that has to be imposed on them. That has mm -hmm. to be – you have to have a state. Which brings me to one point that I am completely fine with co-ops, however you want to organize your business. Now, I think there are better ways, and there are, and there are, some, there are some ways that will be less effective than others. And depending on the size of the group and those kind of things, I think that rapidly becomes a, a bad idea if it's a very large group. Mm -hmm. That's neither here nor there. I'm very comfortable with people choosing to do that. I want to build a little bit, Dan, on, on what you're talking about, the difference between fascism and socialism, because we've got so many different labels for so many different things, and these labels are really important because fascism is really just the far right while socialism is the far left, and that's the important distinction between them, which – of course, makes no sense because you can't have right. the defining characteristic of a thing being its rightness or its leftness. Right. And the common usage of those terms is terrible. It's so inconsistent. It is truly terrible because as as you said, I mean, the, the one argument is that fascism is the business owning the government while socialism is the government owning the businesses. <laughs> and that means nothing. I've never heard that one. That does mean nothing. That, that, I, I haven't – I've never heard it put that clearly. But that, that's, that that's the fundamental difference. If, you, but, if yeah. you break it down, it's supposed to be that. But that's – That only makes sense in a world where the Republicans and – where either the Republicans or Democrats are right. That either business is purely good and government's purely evil or – or the opposite. Yes, because <laughs> only in that world would that distinction make any sense. Because really, if that's your definition, then fascism is just corrupted socialism. Because fascism is still socialism because it's still government control of all the institutions. The difference is you have a revolving door so that those institutions still main control. And of course, that's that's a very real problem with socialism because right now. All these young people look out and they see the system and they see the power that they don't have and they see the obstacles that are in their path and they say the government needs to remove these obstacles through socialism. The problem is, is that so many of these obstacles 
are already there because of government action and in many cases instituted by businesses. But the problem is, is that the businesses already have a strong hold over the government. You know what I mean? You're, you're upset with, with Jeff Bezos for all of the power and money that he gets from Amazon, but you're not upset with the government for all of the favors that they continually give to Jeff Bezos. Including a, what was it, a $10 million contract recently for his attempts to, for his space company? I believe so. I believe so. And here, I'm not even arguing from, from the, the principal side, just from the practical side. The fundamental issue with socialism above all else is that whenever socialism has been enacted, people with power use that power to hold on to their power, and people with power already have connections with the government in order to maintain that power. Countless examples of this time and time again, when you have these these socialist revolutions, you look at you look at communist China, you look at fascist Germany, you look at socialist Russia, you know, three governments, I mean, socialist USSR, I mean, Russia as it was then, these three governments that instituted large amounts of government control over the means of production. And you look at how people existed during that time. And during that time, when the government controlled the means of production, there was still the haves and the have-nots. There were still a group of elites who were powerful and rich, and then there were those who were not. In each of those cases, I have yet mm-hmm. to see mm-hmm. a socialist government that wasn't set up that way. Look at – I mean you can – They didn't have a clear hierarchy yeah, of power. Yeah, I mean you can look at North Korea right now and that's exactly how it's set up where you have a class system for those who are rich and then those who are not. It's former businessmen who get placed at the bottom indefinitely in North Korea. But that's but that doesn't change the reality that that now there is a new class system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> there is still a still an order of classes, and, and this should make perfect sense because if let, let's pretend for a second you could equalize property completely in some way. I don't I don't know how you would do that, but if you could, so that that everyone has the same access to property, at that point. You, you may have nullified the differences in property, but you do that by amplifying the differences in social skills. Someone, someone more persuasive now is less limited by property. Their power in terms of what they can accomplish is amplified by the fact that property is no longer a barrier. Where you eliminate the hierarchy on one dimension, you amplify the hierarchy along other dimensions. When a country becomes socialist, what happens is, as Dan was saying, instead of it being business people who are at the top, it's people who are good at the game of politics, people, depending on whatever the political system is, because in each case it's different. But whatever yeah. that political system is, the people who are good at working within that system – are those who succeed. And the people who are bad at working within that system are those who fail. It does not, it becomes a, a twisted meritocracy, but not a meritocracy that's based on legitimate merit, but rather based off of this one particular instance, this one particular yeah. set of skills, as it were. Right, right. And, and contrast that with the market. This is the, this is the virtue of the market. However you succeeded, maybe you inherited it and you had perfect opportunities or maybe it was just good luck, whatever it was. As you are elevated to the top of the hierarchy in a market, it's because people are willingly giving you money because they want what you're offering, which is to say that you are elevated as you make other people's lives better. That may be a game in some sense, but it's a good game. Yeah, Uh (laughs) uh-huh. It allows people to prosper by benefiting other people. The outcome of that is the prosperity that we see where I have done nothing. I've invented nothing. I've created nothing of of supreme value. But I'm more prosperous than 
than a king would have been a hundred years ago. I've, I've more, more stuff, more opportunities, more education, more all kinds of things. And all of that is as a result of allowing a system where to get to the top, you must benefit everyone else. And to the degree that, that the market stops doing that, you can see where it's corrupted. To the degree people are allowed to rise to the top without doing that, you can see where problems are and where interventions have happened and where distortions are taking place. I have so many thoughts here. I feel like we could have a conversation for hours about this and 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 I'd I'd love to talk about it for for a while because because we've only scratched the surface with with the problems of socialism that are that are hard to see because because our own view of how the United States works right now is so distorted. That's why I'm going to examples, Dan, of actual cases where socialism has been instituted. Because our current system is so convoluted, is so distorted, that it's just it's just weird. You know, um, people talk about how our, our medical system is so broken, right? And this is an example of how the free market in the United States has failed. 60% of all – I'm not sure exactly how you would state this for it to be 100% accurate, but basically 60% of the money that's going into the, into, into the medical industry, the medical field – like I said, I don't have the words right here, but hopefully you'll understand my meaning – is from government. Medicine is 60% government-sponsored today in the United States, and only 40% – is paid by someone like you or me or a company that we work for. I don't think most people realize that. Most people don't realize how big Medicare and Medicaid are and the impact they have on the medical industry. And that's not even talking about the huge world of regulations and restrictions that the government has put in place in the medical world, in the medical fields. There are so many rules, so many requirements. To argue that the medical industry is an example of how the market has failed, I just can't even, it's hard to even argue because I'm just flabbergasted because this is nothing like a market. People talk about how how can you live in the United States where people will die because they can't get medical treatment. And I say every public hospital in the United States is required by law to treat you even if you don't have insurance. Right. Right now if, if – They treat you and then ask for money. Yeah, and then ask for money. And if you can't pay it, there are laws in place to protect you. It doesn't always work out that way, but for the most part, I've heard yeah. real life examples from people who have done that, who have gotten large medical bills and then negotiated with the hospital because they didn't have the money and then they didn't have to pay the vast majority of that bill. And that's an established practice in the United States. To argue that this medical industry is this cutthroat capitalism is just not accurate. But as long as we continue to view it that way, it makes socialism that much more appealing. Instead of saying what we have right now is this half system that is truly broken. It's truly broken. If you want to look at an industry in the United States that bro- that's broken, look at medical industry. The amount that it costs to treat people is outrageous. You know, I, I remember looking at our insurance bill to have a baby and it costs, I mean, you know, and there were complications, but to have it cost $20,000, it just seems insane. It just seems absolutely insane. It is, and I'm glad you mentioned that because this is this is another way in which there is a massive disservice done to arguing these ideas. Like if you said why why is it people are turning to socialism is, is where we started this conversation. This is why, because they will say, look at how screwed up the system is. Socialism will be better. And their counter argument will be, no. The system's are good. really good. Yeah. The system is good. And this is where conservatives have got to learn their principles and they have to apply them and they have to analyze all of their assumptions because too often they are defending things that are entirely indefensible. And they look at the hospitals and they would say, our market system is Is so much better in our outcomes and it's working really well. And you go, (laughs) 
<laughs> first like we do we do have in terms of in terms of outcomes due to our technology and our productivity and our and to a degree our education system we do have better health outcomes than most places in the world it is and i'm sure it's it, maybe it's even the best that does not prove anything regarding how messed up it is right that, <laughs> that that proves that the market in the united states has worked and is amazing at some level but that's in spite of all kinds of crap that's in mm-hmm. spite of so much garbage that is clearly messed up and and so much stuff that i, I don't think you can defend it as you said at at that price, you probably could get that healthcare just about anywhere because you could afford to hire the best doctor in the entire country mm-hmm. right, to deliver your baby and to deal with yeah. If you, if you took twenty grand somewhere else, what you could do with it would be fantastic. No, right? How much are doctors making? Because because honestly, twenty grand for what a week? I yeah, will give you twenty grand. You give me a weeks of your time. Who who's turn, who's turning that down? <laughs> in in some of these countries where where that would be a fortune by itself, let alone in over a week. But anyway, we, we digress. But that that's that is the vision people hold up. They hold up America now versus socialist countries, and not only not only socialist countries. We've been talking specifically about countries like Russia and China and and uh, uh, Nazi Germany because because they. They embraced socialism wide scale. Because, Dan, they bring up European countries as socialist utopias, and they're countries that are not socialist. They bring up no. they bring up these countries like Sweden and Denmark and stuff where they have fantastic nationally required paternity leave and maternity leave and PTO requirements for businesses and say this is a socialist utopia. And, and I, and it's, it's not, it's, it's still a market, but with government intervention, it's just different government intervention than what we have here. We have so, we have in many cases, more government intervention in the market in the United States than these countries. The, the, (laughs) you'll get, you'll get the libertarian free market institutes analyzing these countries and concluding that their economies are more free than, than ours, ours and their industries are more free than ours. No, and, and if you had to if you had to ask me if I would trade straight across for some of these, as you said, these so called uh, socialist, socialist utopias, I would say yes. Absolutely. It's not because it's not because the I like their socialism. It's because I prefer it to ours. Mm-hmm. Right. I prefer that it's not as bad in so many cases. No, and and it's true. When when I see people today who talk about how how you know we have these trillions of dollars of of stimulus that that went to all these random little groups and benefited all these people and yet the conservatives refused to give an extra $600 to regular people i say yeah that is messed up it is messed up that our government interferes in so many different ways and yet, in all that interference, they can't seem to help people in reasonable ways that these other countries do. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's insane that our government can spend more money on medicine than countries like Australia does, even though Australia has socialized medicine. You know what I mean? Australia yeah, can <laughs> pay for every person in Australia to have free health care for less per capita than the U.S. spends, you know what I mean, and yes. not have free health care. That's an yes, example an, of how broken our system is. And you get this in part because of the – there are a lot – often, especially compared to the European uh, socialist paradises, in quotes, uh, they are – we overregulate to a massive degree. They do not have near the regulations we have. They don't have near the licensure requirements. They don't have near the – you know, and at the level of how do you get things started and how do you get people to, and pay them to do this work and such, uh, they are much freer than we are. They have much fewer restrictions. And part of it is that we have really systematized handouts to special interests in mm-hmm. a way that is, mm-hmm. that is just, that, that deserves a pat on the back. It's, it is amazing. Like uh, we have, we have cr- turned it into a fine art. How do we get small amounts of money from everybody in the country to go to 
a handful of individuals in every single industry, we've, we have turned this into an art form. The, 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 <laughs> the earmarks and the, the, uh, special interest payouts are truly astounding and they come from both parties. And the the numbers that they add up to are insane. And and Dan, you're absolutely right because when it comes down to it, you know, we keep talking about the market, and and it's the market is not some supernatural force. The market is not some mystical thing that we mar- worship. The market is simply allowing people to produce and to trade. Those two things fundamentally is what the market is because that's how as Dan said the world has progressed in the last 100 years is people are allowed to make things and they're allowed to trade those things with others and that has what has allowed everything that we enjoy today and and to see that to see all that growth but then to see all the problems we have today And to say the solution is, is to keep all of the government interference that we have today, but then get rid of that last shred of market, is to completely miss the mark, is to completely miss the reality of what's going on, because we're we're completely talking over each other here. And by we, I'm saying us as... As libertarians, as those who are in favor of of allowing people to live and and liberals who believe in socialism, I feel like we could be on the same page so easily if we could just actually understand what we're talking about. Because in many cases, the words we're using are not accurately describing what's happening. And that's the fundamental problem. It is a fundamental problem. And I think, I think part of it comes, uh, well, there, there, are, there are so many directions we could go with this. And we will definitely have to revisit this topic because of that. But I, w- I want to point out two things that for socialism to work, when once you have communal ownership at the state level, the state determines exchanges. It negotiates exchanges. And there is a big difference between me trying to make my life better. And so I try and figure out what I can make, what I can do. And I trade that for currency or goods. And a group of people doing it at a societal level. You do not get the same exchanges. You don't, you don't get individual actors you don't get what you were talking about with the market. You don't get people producing and people exchanging. What you get is a state dictating what happens. And that means where in a market, you can act to make your life and the lives of those around you better. In a socialist society, you can vote, but everybody is voting and everybody's voting to make their life better. <laughs> well, in a socialist society, you have whatever means of influencing the state available to you to make your life better. Mm -hmm. But it always comes at the expense of other people. Because basically what you're saying, Dan, is that when it comes to if everyone is deciding how things get distributed, well, everyone wants everything for themselves. Not everything in the sense that they want everything, but they want what's best for themselves. They want as much as possible so that they can thrive. It's just natural human. It's just it's just human nature to want to thrive. And so obviously, if everyone truly has an equal vote, then everything gets equally distributed. But naturally, what's going to happen is some people are going to be better at arguing for their needs than others, and those are the ones who are going to get more. Is that? But the key, the key, Dan, is that when government controls the means of production, when government controls who can trade with who, the natural result is a breakdown in productivity and a breakdown in in the market, in trade, because it's just not possible for the government to decide the most optimal usage of 300 million people in what they choose, what they're going to do every day in order to benefit society. There is no AI that can handle that today. There is no group of people who can figure it out. Right now, the only reason markets work is because you have the brain power of 300 million people 
operating using their own self-interest as a motivator to produce as much as possible. As soon as you take that away, the whole thing collapses. And that's what you see in actual socialist utopias, not so-called socialist utopias that still have trade, that still have production, but in socialist utopias where the government truly controls production, things always break down. There's a reason 50 million people died in China and millions upon millions died in Russia, including millions and millions who died from starvation. That's not a good track record. No, it's not a good track record, and it's perfectly predictable because in right now, I try and solve all of the problems in my life, in my, in my family's life, right? They're my responsibility. No one else is going to solve them for me. Right now, society functions in part because everyone is trying to solve their problems and the problems of the people they care about. And as such, we all are getting an immense amount done at a level that is so particular to the information we have. There, there is a cost-benefit analysis that happens in your decisions on a daily basis, whether conscious or unconscious, as you prioritize what's most important to you automatically. Maybe you do this consciously or maybe not. But you in your own mind have a, a set of things that you want. You have a, a hierarchy of valuations of the things that you're doing. Right now you're doing something. And that thing is at the top of your list. <laughs> and maybe your list is terrible and maybe it needs some serious adjustment. That's not the point. The point is that require all of that comes about as a culmination of all the things you know. Now, and you can take this one simple question. In my neighborhood, say down the street, there's a, there's a building that's open. What should that, what could that building be used for? Maybe it would be a good spot for a restaurant. Maybe it would be a good spot for uh, a gym. Maybe it would be a good spot for you know, a thousand other things. And it would be a terrible spot for most things. Who has the information necessary to make that call? It's going to be someone who cares a lot about it for a variety of reasons, who, has a, who happens to run a gym and have seen similar areas, who happens to have an uh, an enormous amount of extremely particular information about this place and about a particular industry. You cannot centralize that. That cannot be centralized. That cannot be dictated from on high. That cannot be a decision made by a committee of people who do not all have that information. That must be made by an individual who says, I know, and I will take the risk. In fact, Dan, I would take it one step farther. I would say it would be near impossible for that committee to even figure out who that person is, who the right person right. to run that business is. I look at businesses all the time, and I say, who the crap came up with this? Who was sitting there <laughs> who and was this like, idea. Yeah. this is what's needed, even though it's wildly successful. I would have never dreamed that that was a possibility. And yet a here we spinner. are. Yeah, no kidding. What on earth? Who thought that was a good idea? Whoever it was, was obviously knew more about it than I did, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were, they were, they were absolutely right. Uh, Toad singing chandelier on YouTube. Who thought that was necessary? But clearly who it was. That? But clearly, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> that was a thing we needed. Now, and, the, and you, you want, in the U.S., you want 350 million or whatever the population is these days. People thinking about that. You want 350 million people thinking about that. And the people who are sure to take the risk and to try it. And, and when it doesn't work, for someone else to try it. Or to try something and, completely different. And to try something different, yes. That's, that's what a market can bring that social decisions and ownership of, of other things can't. And at the heart of that is property. And there's, and this, this is an old problem that, or, and at the heart of that is property. You know, we focus mostly on, on efficiency and on the practical problems, on calculation problems, uh, the economic calculation problem. You could look that up. That's, that's basically what we were just summarizing there. Uh, there were some Nobel Prize winning essays on that by, by people like Hayek. Um, but there is one, 
there is one other issue that I really want to point out in this is that if you don't have control over the property, you don't have freedom. And I'm not saying control over all the, all the property. I mean, you could say the person with perfect freedom is the person who owns everything. <laughs> you could say there's a scale, <laughs> a scale of, uh, of potential for what you could do depending on how much you own, right? I wouldn't call that freedom, but there's certainly some kind of, but it, but certainly a kind of freedom, right? That's not usually what people are talking about when they say, I want freedom. But that there is a kind of freedom that comes with, with power and influence and money. But if you don't have property, if you don't have a car, if you don't have if you don't have if you don't have the ability to own what you produce i mean that's that's the primary reason yes. you have to have property from a utilitarian perspective because if you can't own what you produce you lose the incentive to produce in the first place you lose the incentive to produce and you lose the freedom that comes with it your freedom is directly tied to things in a way that of course you you may have autonomy of your your body and mind and you could say that's separate in some sense from, from control over stuff. And it is. You could draw a line there. But would you say you have freedom if you have control of your body and your mind, but you do not ever get to decide what happens with a thing? You don't get to decide anything about clothes. You don't get to decide anything about food. You don't get to decide anything about transportation. You don't get to decide anything about stuff. The point at which your body and your mind engages with the world is at the point of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if your freedom doesn't extend to control over stuff, you have no freedom. You have no freedom. Yeah, you want to be an artist? You don't. Yeah, you want to be an artist? Great. You need access to stuff. You need, you need to be able to decide what you're going to put on that canvas and at least attempt it. And without that, you have nothing. No, you can be nothing. A great example of that, Dan, is there are there are large tracts of basically unexplored wilderness where you can go days without meeting another human being. And technically that land is owned by the government and you can't build stuff there. You can't do a lot of things there. But at any point, you can leave the world and go live there. At any point, right, and if, you can, if, and you could build stuff, and no one would find you. Yeah, but I mean, but I mean, assuming that stuff <laughs> yeah. doesn't matter, you know, assuming that stuff doesn't matter, you can run naked through the woods, foraging for berries for the rest of your natural life, and no one will stop you. You know what I mean? No, I'm saying if stuff is, if if all that matters <laughs> right. is yeah. your ability to yeah. move and your yeah. ability to just be yourself, you could do that, and in basically anywhere. The, the fundamental issue when we talk about freedom, when we talk about government, when we talk about all these things is about stuff because without stuff, that's all that's left is, is running naked through the forest foraging for berries. <laughs> I, I think of uh, Locke. John Locke was a, an interesting fellow in, a, in some ways. I think he's the epitome of several bad ideas, but he's also the heart of several very good ideas. So I have mixed feelings about him and I've read and written quite a bit about him. He, uh, Locke was looking at a particular problem. And this is, I think, an interesting philosophical exercise to put yourself in his shoes. He's looking at the monarchies and he's looking at the, the, he's convinced that it's wrong to do bad things to people and that the state can't have that authority. The king can't just decapitate people on a whim. There, that's wrong. So where is the line? How do you draw the line around moral action with other people? And he's looking at the claims that people have for the you know, king is divine, has some kind of divine authority. And he's like, that's obviously a scriptural and, and, a, and immoral. <laughs> and he, he's trying to draw the line. So you could say, uh, yes, obviously you can't go just stick a knife in somebody. I mean, that, would, that clearly crosses the line. I think everybody listening to this would agree. Um, there may be special circumstances where an execution may be warranted or self-defense or those kind of things. But in, in general, you don't just go stick knives in people. But at what level does that stop? They have, they have some control over their body. Okay. Some control over their thoughts. Okay. They have some control over, over their words. Okay. Do we grant them some control over the world around them through the fruits of their labor, through, through property? Well, if you don't, the rest of it doesn't really matter. 
because if I can come and take the food out of your hand and eat it at any time, your life, your very life, your very existence depends on others. You are not independent. Mm-hmm. You are not a person. You are some part of a whole or you're some ant and it's just a part of the, the hive or whatever it may be. You're, you are not a human being. So where is the line on property? There must be some property unless you accept that the people can come take the food off, come grab your fork and eat the food themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. There is a realm of property. And, and where is it? And that, Dan, I think is, is really important because going back to socialism, Karl Marx argues that property is theft. And therefore, we need to abolish property. And we do that through state action, which theoretically sounds, sounds nice. But in practice, what's happening is that property still exists. He's just transferring the ownership of property from individuals to the government. He's not abolishing property. He's simply transferring who controls it. And that's what socialism happens in practice every time. Because that's what socialism is, is government control of property. Because that line has to be drawn somewhere. You truly can't have the property belong to no one. It does not work. Right. And, and And who is the government? Well, ultimately, it's influential and political you know, it's people who are skilled at the game of politics, whatever that game may look like. It's not like the it's either people or the government. It's which game do you want people to have to play to get control of it? Because ultimately, there will be people in control of it. As you said, you, he's not actually abolishing property. What he's doing is he's creating a different game to play, different levers that you have to pull to be able to decide where the property goes. And in this case, it just becomes all political rather than some of it becoming based on you deciding what to do with it. And unless you think you're going to be at the top of that stack, <laughs> this, is one of the, this is one of the things that people don't realize, the utopia, people like uh, the, the political, the constant threats. Oh, no, that's it. It's Ali. I don't want to go down. Yeah. This this leaves us at a it it's something of a strange place and something of a of a mental cliffhanger in terms of <laughs> of philosophy, because if you if you accept that there is some property and that that property that at that level you need the consent of the people, this is where we get into the basic idea of democracy and liberalism, not liberalism as it is today, but liberalism broadly, uh, liber- the kind of liberalism that that people like John Locke helped create and helped start. And it's the idea that, that, yes, people are individuals and they are sovereign in some sense over their bodies, their minds, and their stuff. However you want to define their stuff, but they have stuff and it's, and it's theirs. And at that point, to, to take any of that from them or to use any of that, they need to A, either have acted unjustly or B, consented. And government gets its authority from consent. And that's why government can act to do certain things. And that's why, and that's in some cases where socialism is getting its justification from, right? And in the modern democratic forms that, that you can, as a government, decide this is the best way to do it. But at that level, consent becomes very gray. And it's a topic we'll have to address another time. Because, that's a whole other can of worms. Because you can define consent in such a way that you're simply stealing, right? That you're, you are not actually, there is actually no consent. And the government is merely seizing whatever goods it feels like. And you have, in effect, even, even people who've accepted the idea that there is private property, then rapidly discard it through a series of, of bad ideas. I want to do a quick recap here because part of what we're doing here is we're trying to ha- to get you to, to re-examine these words and what they mean, because socialism has so much stigma attached to it. But really what socialism is, is the government control over the means of production. And there's varying degrees of that. But socialism is not usually viewed that way. It's, it's viewed a little bit differently, which is why so often conservatives today 
push back on specific issues and not others. You know, conservatives hate the idea of any kind of socialized medicine, but they have absolutely no problem allowing the government to pass a myriad of restrictions on trade and businesses time and time again. Or to keep the parts of the healthcare system that are already socialist. Exactly, exactly. Because one has the perception of being socialism, while one has the perception of just being normal capitalism. And these conservative politicians are only operating that way because that's what the conservative voters are expecting of them. And these conservative voters are expecting that of them because they haven't actually thought through, as Dan said, the principles of government that they're trying to operate on. They don't have clear-cut principles, and because of that, they will just as often vote for socialism as not because they don't actually have a clear understanding of what socialism is. So for all of you conservatives out there listening, stop fighting against socialism, the word, and start fighting against what socialism actually is, which is government control over property. And if you start doing that, then you can actually start undoing a lot of the the current problems that we have now. And for those of you out there who are advocating for socialism, I strongly suggest that you look at alternatives because there isn't just this dichotomy of what the conservatives call capitalism and what is called socialism because in many ways they are not that different. And there are other options out there. Right. They're often a difference of a degree and in so many cases, a very small degree. Right? Not, this isn't actually that that different. It's why sometimes we've, we observe that conservatives aren't, aren't for limited government. They're for less government than liberals. Mm -hmm. And often it's very slightly less. Or sometimes it's not even less. It's just a different government. And with that, thank you for listening. This has been episode 46 of the Rethinking Politics podcast. Find us on our website, rethinkingpolitics.podbean.com. You can reach out to us on social media through Twitter or Facebook. And we'll see you next week.